Okay, so we shall start from the book, the, the travel log in the Caucasian countries and the Transcaucasia. Um, Professor Cohen already mentioned uh, Yuda Choni and his books. I will be very brief. Uh, Choni is describing religious life and the customs of the mountain Jews, and in particular, Caucasian Jews. Yosef Yudachani was born in Minsk uh, and spent 10 years in the region and documented his journey in a book that was published posthumously by Eliyahu Arkavi, as mentioned, in 1884. Among other things, he documented the Rosh Hashanah days in Kuban, a very detailed description where he stayed in 1877. Charney was surprised and excited by this experience as he mentioned in the last sentence of his description. So, so in such a way passed the two days of Rosh Hashanah with joy and ple pleasure. For many days I will remember the Rosh Hashanah of this particular year. And we are also approaching Rosh Hashanah now as we speak. Where is Kuban? Kuban is a Jewish village. It's a village that where only mountain Jews live. It no longer exists. And he, the name Kuban was later changed to Uchkulan. Uh, it's at the uh, uh, Kuban uh, River in Karachi, very close to uh, the mountain of Alberos, as you saw in the previous presentation. And now let's move to Agnon. As I said, Agnon, the Jewish well-known author, has brought the uh, document with very minor changes in his anthology days of old. Agnon wanted these anthologies to enter the Beit Midrash or the synagogue as he himself writes, so the men can read this book during break time between prayers, and this will invoke his heart. And this essay will be published in a new book that is full of the old words of the Torah, wisdom, a book that can be written, uh, read in between. And he also mentioned and highlights in all these books, in all these anthologies, I haven't brought only the words believers of God, and that's important for my lecture. And he also wrote what actually uh, can distinguish this uh, anthology from others. Of course, he had his own worldview of how to compile anthologies and what would be their cultural impact, especially in the 20th century. So much for the quotes. Unlike other anthologies, in Days of Awe and in others of Agnon, Agnon brings a very vast array of works, and he doesn't only choose one genre, like the Agadah or the Hasidic literature. You can see say that the entire Jewish literature casebook was open to him, and he chose from its treasures. The anthologies of Agnon uh, uh, are shown in his uh, prolific writing, but these were not researched. Agnon truly appreciated the anthologies, and about his uh, anthology days of all, oh, he mentioned uh, somewhere that this is the greatest work that I have uh, compiled. A few uh, words about Days of Old. This is a book of customs of Midrash and Agada for the Days of Atonement and Mercy for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and the days in between. One chapter on Rosh Hashanah is brought under the title From Far and From Near. Uh, and that's Rosh Hashanah in Kuban. And here I start reading the description of Charni in the 19th century. On the eve of Rosh Hashanah, I came with my landlord to pray in their synagogue. The synagogue was built like a Tatar Ishmael uh, mosque, but it was very poor. Remember your lecture. 
the house was leaning on a few pillars. The floor was covered by hay and straw that was very, very poor. A few uh, white candles were bur burning, and the entire congregation was sitting on the floor. Everyone was silent, and those who could pray, and you all mentioned that, uh, whispered their prayers without any crying or any show of grief. After the prayer, they wished each other happy holidays. On Rosh Hashanah night at 30 in the morning, all gathered into the synagogue, and during the prayer, they never wept or shed a tear. Remember that this is Shoni, who was born in Minsk, and he was really surprised by this and he finds a totally different Rosh Hashanah to what he knew. So the cantor also uh, prayed in his heart. They didn't cry before the blowing of the shofar, and after the shofar, those who had a long time went out and smoked. Of the women, not one came to hear the shofar, because they were all busy working in the kitchen, preparing lunch. Before the Musaf prayer, all the uh, congregation grouped together inside the synagogue. After the prayer, I went with my landlord together with the elders and the dignitaries to my home. When we approached the yard, I saw a very strange scene. A large camp of women, uh, young and older women, were standing in my courtyard and waited for my arrival. When I set foot in the yard, those uh, women and the younger ones started singing using different instruments that are called harmonica and flutes, and they were beating the drums and ringing the uh, bells. And the young women were dancing and sang songs in honor of my arrival. They were all worn with uh, very beautiful ornamented uh, clothes like the Muslim women. So there are dancing and uh, musical instruments, truly very impressive. I'll just choose a few uh, phrases here. In the late afternoon, the cavalier came to the courtyard. There were two guests, and my landlord told me that there were two princes of the Karachi dynasty. And then he talks about the Tashlich custom that they adopted later, but only a few go and do their Tashlich, and not the entire congregation. And another sentence, and they uh, asked me to go to their scholar's house for Kiddush prayer. He really describes Rosh Hashanah to the very detail. Just another one. From the house of the scholar, We together went to my home, together with the entire congregation, but I will perhaps only read the very important sentence, and then the young men took the young women to dance, and the scholar too started dancing with the young woman uh, to the tune of the drums and the flutes and the harmonica. So even the scholar dances, and remember, Agnon writes, but it doesn't include everything. Uh, he chooses what to present. And perhaps just the last sentence, two uh, days of Rosh Hashanah passed with great joy and ple pleasure. For many, many days, I shall remember Rosh Hashanah of this particular year. After the holiday, but this description has a parallel description with edition that was written, it was published in Hamagid uh, publication, and I will bring the appendix. After the holiday, I talked with the rabbi, the scholar, about the custom that they sing using instruments on Rosh Hashanah. How can they do that? Because it is forbidden by law 
to use instruments, uh, musical instruments on Shabbat and holidays, especially the two days of Rosh Hashanah that are only meant for repentance and prayer, because these are high holidays and days of judgment. And the answer of the rabbi is most surprising. He said, the custom to use musical instruments uh, on Shabbat and holidays is an ancient one that remained from us because we received it from our elders. Our ancestors used to do it when they were still on their land. So it's like what Aviada Cohen said, there is not just a statement, but rather a tradition, an ancient tradition from land of Israel. And even though the uh, tour, the Arba'at Turim laws, he says, I know the halacha, even though the rules of Arba'at Turim are kept and we adhere to them, but the customs of our ancient, we have no powers to revoke them or change them because the Jewish custom is its uh, law. And uh, Nehemiah says, and that's exactly what you see in the book of Nehemiah, that you should not weep or be sad on Rosh Hashanah, but rather be extremely, extremely happy. Beyond all these details, including the halachic one, what stands out is the customs of Kuban, unlike what uh, Chani was expecting. In the Kuban community, Rosh Hashanah are truly joyful days of singing and dancing. It is truly a holiday. These are not days of awe in any form or shape. What was the character of Rosh Hashanah in the people of Israel over the many generations? We should emphasize that the expression days of all or high holidays appears for the first time only in the 12th century by the Ashkenazi scholars, whereas the Mishnah talks about a holiday of Rosh Hashanah. The dimension of Day of Judgment is also mentioned in the Mishnah, but in those days, in the days of the sages and the Mishnah and the Talmud, it was not blurred yet, and it remained as a joyful day, unlike what we hear from Ezra and Hemaya. Uh, the process of emphasizing uh, Rosh Hashanah's the Day of Judgment became stronger in the Amorah, and uh, arrived in Ashkenaz in the 12th century following the Crusades. We should also see the combination. All of a sudden I see that I have a lot of time. We should see how Agnon includes this description and see it in a broader context. And I talk about his stance concerning multiculturalism in the people of Israel. This multi, uh, multicultural approach of Agnon can be seen in the most beautiful way in his description of uh, we shall not fail. And he says the following. Uh, the order of my prayer has changed from the days of my ancestors and I keep changing the order of my prayer. And how can a person change the order of his uh, ancestors? It is because of the changes that I went through from my, at the beginning of my life. After a few years of exile, I returned to the land of Israel and I resided in Jerusalem. I thought that this would be the place of my prayer and I will pray according to a fixed order. But from the love of the holy sites, I visited all the synagogues and all the Beit Midrash and 480 synagogues and Beit Midrash can be found in Jerusalem. In each and every one of them, you find a different version of prayer. And wherever I go, I use the local version in order to include my prayer with that of the congregation. We should very briefly comment about the different stances that were prevalent during these days when Agnon wrote these texts. The very prevalent approach of the beginning of the Zionist movement from the first days of the State of Israel was the one called the melting pot.
that blurs the differences and the gaps between the different communities in Israel and aspires to unify the culture out of the multiculturalism of our cultures. The most well-identified figure is Ben-Gurion, who very explicitly uh, emphasized the role of the entire social system in unifying all cultures. In the religious context, different leaders made an effort to combine uh, communities and to create one cultural codex. Two dominant uh, leaders implemented the melting pot approach in the religious sphere. The first one was Rabbi Shlomo Groen, when he served as the chief rabbi of uh, the IDF. He printed a unified prayer book uh, given to all soldiers. The second one is Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, who argued that all those who arrive in the land of Israel should behave and abide by the local customs according to Rabbi Yosef Karo. Here it merits mentioning that every one of these individuals mentioned, Ben Gurion, Rabbi Goren, and Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, each worked to turn the uh, melting pot into the one that you would follow and adhere to the culture that they each belong to. I believe, and I'm approaching the end, Agnon truly objected to the melting pot approach and did various opposite things. So it was very important for him to present in his days of all anthology uh, the description of Rosh Hashanah in Kuban and also as mentioned in We Shall Not Fail that we mentioned. Very briefly, we saw three things here, and I will briefly talk about them. The customs of Rosh Hashanah in Kuban over 150 years ago, the description is not only beautiful and impressive, but also extremely important. We saw this tension between days of all as a day uh, and the holiday of Rosh Hashanah, and we very briefly talked about this tension between the melting pot that was very prevalent and the multicultural approach pursued by Agnon and we do hope that we will be not only in days of awe but also in days of joy. Uh, uh, thank you very much Professor Menachem Katz. With your permission I would like to take advantage of being the chair and I will say something about Agnon that is not probably well known. In 1950 or 51, a professional committee was held concerning who will receive the Israel Prize for Jewish Literature. The chairperson of the committee was Professor Kloisner, and they suggested that Agnon uh, is uh, definitely the right candidate, and his answer was, Agnon, he's a folklore writer. In other words, the relations between them were, was not that great. I'm sure others uh, wrote about this. But this only strengthens the stance that Professor Katz talked about, the uh, approach that Agnon had to Jewish tradition as the uh, pluralistic uh, approach. We now adjourn and we'll see each other in the next session. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to the speakers.